Right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's lovely to be joining you online today uh, from Sydney. Um, and thank you to the Bibliographical Society for inviting me to present this paper. My name's Erin Mollenhauer, and I'm the team leader of Library and Archives at Moore College in Sydney. So Moore College uh, exists to enable men and women through higher education in the field of theology to deepen their knowledge of God. It is the Theological College of the Anglican Diocese of Sydney. And its library, the Donald Robinson Library, holds over 300,000 volumes, as well as extensive electronic material. The rare book collection holds nearly 8,000 volumes, including two in Cunabula. One of the most significant sub-collections in the rare book collection is known as the Port Jackson Lending Library, which was brought to Australia by Reverend Samuel Marsden in 1809. Reverend Samuel Marsden, second colonial chaplain, magistrate, sheep breeder, and polarizing figure known to some as the flogging parson and to others as Greatheart Marsden, returned to his home country in 1808 for two years. He had several goals for his trip, recruiting clergymen and schoolmasters and getting government salaries for them, proposing policy changes to the board of the London Missionary Society and persuading the Church Missionary Society to extend its work into New Zealand. He also spent some time with William Wilberforce. Marsden's project of collecting books to bring back colony in order to set up a lending library were described in the November 1809 issue of the Eclectic Review. A lending library to consist of the most valuable and useful publications in religion, morals, mechanics, agriculture, commerce, general history and geography to be lent out under his own control and that of his clerical colleagues to soldiers, free settlers, convicts and all others who may have time to read so as to prevent idleness and occupy the mind in the best and most rational manner. This summary indicates that the general purpose of the library was to promote not only education, but industry. It aimed to include books on mechanics, agriculture and commerce, and demonstrated the view that reading itself was a worthwhile occupation. According to historian Meredith Lake, Marsden had grown up with the belief that diligent labour had great dignity and spiritual worth and that idleness was not only a threat to the colony's prosperity, it was a profound moral failing. The appeal for books was apparently quite successful. A young woman named Elizabeth Gurney, who later did great work in prison reform under her married name, Elizabeth Fry, organized a parcel of religious tracts and spelling books, which were intended for lending out among the colonists and for use in schools. The British and Foreign Bible Society gave 500 Bibles and 1500 New Testaments. And the Methodist leader, Joseph Butterworth, and the associates of Dr. Bray also contributed. Such grand aspirations ought to have created a wonderfully rich resource for the growing colony. Instead, the whole scheme appears to have fizzled out a little bit. And Marsden, although Marsden distributed the tracts and Bibles, he only ever lent books to acquaintances in a private capacity. This was a great disappointment to some, who used the incident to attack Marsden in the press, through letters to the Sydney Gazette in 1814. Someone calling themselves a free settler writes on the 4th of March, Having arrived here lately as a free settler with my wife and family, I beg to inform you that previous to my leaving England, 
I learned with much satisfaction that a good library had been established here for the use and benefit for the rising generation. And this, I assure you, gave me great satisfaction and was a very strong inducement to my embarking my young family for this far distant climb. So strongly, Mr. Editor, was I impressed with the idea that books suitable to the education and improvement of youth might be drawn from this public source, that the portion of my slender means, which I should have devoted to the purchase of useful books, has been otherwise appropriated. And now on inquiry about such a library, I have the misfortune to learn that no such has ever had an existence here. Another free settler replies on March the 12th. I also heard in England of the collection of books made by the principal chaplain of the colony. Soon after I arrived, I applied for books and have never been without two or three in the house. It has also come to my knowledge that the 73rd Regiment and persons residing at Sydney, Parramatta, Balkham Hills, Kissing Point, Hawkesbury and George's River have been supplied with books from the same library. The free settler replies on March 19th. If this reverend gentleman had received a valuable collection of books for the public benefit, he would have considered it an indispensable duty to have established the library so collected at Sydney, where the population is at least sixfold greater than that of any other place in the territory and where, of course, the benefit of it might be expected to be proportionably more widely diffused. Marsden then felt compelled to defend himself on March 26th and state plainly that there is no public library in this settlement, nor ever has been, nor are there any funds to support one. When last in England, I collected from my friends a few books on religion and agriculture and other useful subjects to lend to settlers, soldiers and prisoners at my discretion. But I am not accountable to the writer of the last letter or to the public for the distribution of these books, though they have not been withheld from anyone that has applied for them. He viewed these letters as an attempt to asperse his public character and tried to get the editor of the Sydney Gazette to tell him who the author was so he could sue him for libel. When this didn't work, he asked Governor Macquarie, also unsuccessfully. The only books from this original collection which we are aware of and now belong to Moore College are those donated by the Associates of Thomas Bray. This association was founded in 1724 by Thomas Bray, an English clergyman, who also founded the Society for Promoting Christian Knowledge and the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel in Foreign Parts. His aim was to spread literacy and Christianity across England and America, and the Associates had a particular interest in the religious education of enslaved African Americans. It is not at all surprising that they would want to support such a scheme for a new library in a new colony, as described in the Eclectic Review. Of the books in Marsden's collection, there remain 69 titles, all carrying the book plate of the Associates of Thomas Bray. These books are all theological in nature, with a distinctly Anglican flavor. Sermons by Offspring Blackall, the Bishop of Exeter, John Orr, Archdeacon of Ferns in Ireland, William Sherlock, Dean of St Paul's, as well as Bible commentaries by Simon Patrick, Bishop of Ely. Several books instruct the reader in Anglican theology and worship. Six lectures on the church catechism by Samuel Glass, a Vindication of the Civil Establishment of Religion by John Rogers, Lectures on the Catechism of the Church of England by Thomas Secker, and an Exposition of the 39 Articles by Gilbert Burnett. A couple of titles demonstrate the Associates' American connections. Four sermons 
preached at the parish church of St. Peter in Talbot County in the province of Maryland by Thomas Bacon, an English clergyman who was involved in the transatlantic slave trade and owned a number of slaves when he emigrated to Maryland. And also the knowledge and practice of Christianity made easy to the meanest capacities or an essay towards the instruction for the Indians by Thomas Wilson, Bishop of Sodor and Man. That's your 10 minute notice. Yes, okay. Um, many of the books have a previous owner's name inscribed on the flyleaf or title page or their book plate inside the front cover. This suggests the associates also appealed for and collected secondhand books to stock the libraries they were establishing. With the exception of this gilt tooled red calf binding, they're bound in plain calf with minor tooling. The book plate of all these books is a generic printed one with blanks to be filled in by hand for dates, places, name of county and diocese. They obviously didn't want to print another book plate, especially for this collection destined for a colony not a county. So the word county has been altered by hand to colony. The colony, as far as the Anglican Church was concerned, was considered part of the Diocese of London until the Archdeaconry of New South Wales was established by letters patent in 1824 as part of the Diocese of Calcutta. The Diocese of Australia was formed in 1836 and further subdivision resulted in the formation of the Diocese of Sydney in 1847. As Marsden declared the books in this collection to be his private property, they would most likely have been kept at his home. In, uh, the books now owned by Moore College made their way into the Sydney Diocesan Library, which operated at various locations, including Church House next to St Andrew's Cathedral. The introduction to the catalogue of the Bishop Broughton Memorial Library uh, says that the Diocesan Library was transferred to Moore College in 1959. But the minutes of the College Committee in 1959 mentioned the Diocesan Library books as already being part of the College Library and say nothing about their acquisition. In any case, whenever it happened, this was a substantial acquisition as the Diocesan Library held not only Marsden's books, but the copy of Cruden's Concordance to the Holy Bible, which the first colonial chaplain, Richard Johnson, brought out with him on the First Fleet. Um, and to find out more about the library, including our rare book collection, you can go to library.more.edu.au. And I'm very happy to answer any questions um, sent to my email. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that really, really interesting exploration of some of those really interesting items that you've got there. I'm just asking for any questions from the um, from our attendees to pop them into Q&A so that we can um, have a few minutes of question time. So I was wondering about the um, this, this question of what, you know, um, one of the letters that you read out said something about, I hear that you've got a good library. And I was thinking, um, you know, what, what does make a good library in that, um, in that early time of the New South Wales colony or any other kind of um, in new, new establishment? Are there, are there qualities that might be uh, included in that statement of what make of you know of a good library. Do we have any information on that? Um, hmm. That's a good question because the advertisement in the eclectic review kind of indicates what Marsden seemed to think would be a good library. Um, you know, encouraging sort of information about industry, agriculture, as well as religion. Um, the interesting thing about the, the free settled letter is that he seems to think the library would be more aimed at youth or young people or perhaps his children. So that's what, certainly yeah. what he's looking for. Yeah, interesting. 